it's nothing you can do. Oh, no, That's it's... perfect. Okay, here we are. Hello, YouTube, and welcome. My, I am Tart, your host, and I've got with me here Dr. Walter Bodmer. I'm going to let him introduce himself, tell us a little bit about himself, and we'll go straight into the topic for tonight. Um, Dr. Bodmer, can you start with telling me a little bit about yourself, who, it, what, who you are, what you do, and why it is you do what you do? Hi, uh, well, I'm Walter Bodmer. Um, I actually was born in Germany, and we had to leave when I was two and a half because of Hitler, but I was being brought up from and spent most of my life in England. I studied mathematics and a bit of statistics, and then through a very famous statistician and geneticist, R.A. Fisher, I did my PhD with him, and that's how I got into genetics. And having done that, I decided I'd better do work in the lab, and molecular biology and all that, and DNA and the things that one talks about in genetics. So I did a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University with another famous Nobel Prize winner, in this case, Joshua Lederberg, who worked out how you can do genetics with bacteria. So from then, I, I got on, eventually came back to the UK and got involved in cancer research because they thought that a geneticist might be able to run a major cancer research organization, which I did for a while. And then after that, um, having spent some time in Oxford before that, I came back to Oxford. I was in charge of one of the Oxford colleges, and I'm still in Oxford as a, uh, in terms of my base for where I work. I have a lab, and I have a major interest in cancer research, especially in cancer of the bowel, a major interest in genetics, human genetics, how we vary and what that means, and keep my brain going as long as I can at my age. That's fantastic. I um, this, this topic is a bit close at heart for me, especially recently. So um, a, a friend of mine uh, two days ago uh, told us that she is uh, she's essentially losing her battle with cancer. Um, she won't be with us in about six to eight months. It's uh, it's been very a very sad and trying time. But it was interesting that I um, I had requested to speak to a geneticist, and then there was the, the the sort of moment where I was like, "Oh my god!" And the geneticist has has experience with cancer, and I'm going, "This is just this. The, it's just too perfect how it lined up like that." Because I do have um, curiosities, particularly about the future of genetics and how that can play into um, overcoming the, the kinds of cancers that are out there. Um, so I'd like to start with those kinds of questions. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about? Um, but let's start with, tell me a little bit about what, what does, what's the role of a geneticist in helping to combat cancer? What, what do you do and what's the idea behind it? Well, the idea is, is, is very clear cut. Cancer is a disease of cells in the body. You know, we're made up of cells. And although we start from one cell, the fertilized egg, uh, which has the basic information we got from our parents, uh, we have lots of different cells in different parts of the body making up different tissues, the bowel, uh, the stomach, lung, and so on. And when uh, you get uh, mutations, when you get changes in what you've actually inherited that give a cell, uh, to turn it into a rogue cell, if you will, so that it can grow without the normal constraints, that's when you get a cancer. So it, it's really a sort of evolutionary process within the body that one of your cells in a major tissue, like if it's in the bowel, on the surface of the bowel, um, acquires a mutation which gives it that advantage over its neighbors, which it wouldn't normally have. And then you get another step, it gets a further advantage. And so it's a series of genetic, or sometimes we call epigenetic changes, um, one step at a time that gives you this huge growth advantage, gives you the lump that's a cancer that can spread to other parts of the body. And that's why at the level of the cells that are cancer cells, genetics is absolutely key. Okay, and that's awesome. very different from inheriting a tendency to get a cancer, which is genetics that you inherit from your mother or father through the sperm and the egg, and they carry that information. That's a different type. That's a different thing. That's what one usually thinks of as inheritance. Can you go into the difference between genetics and epigenetics? You mentioned those two things there. might be interesting yes, to flesh those out. You, as I said, you start with uh, the genome, as we call it, with the genetic information you get from both parents. And that's one cell. But the body has lots of different sorts of cells, cells in the blood, variety of cells, cells in different tissues. 
So how do you get different cells from one set of information? The answer is that you use parts of the information at any given time, and you use it in various ways. So that means, in a sense, you've, the DNA is the language of the genes, <coughs> and you make a protein, which is a, a sequence of amino acids of chemical structures, uh, and you make different combinations of these in different tissues. And the way that's done is by only using a part of the information in any given tissue. And the way that's done is really what epigenetics is about. That's what controls what is being used to make one type of cell rather than another. So it's sort of the activations of specific genes so that those genes are the ones that are expressed is what you're trying yes, to communicate. There. Okay, right. awesome. Fantastic. I was about how you've used the words express and genes and I... I I'm not sure how much everybody understands nowadays, but most people... I don't know either. <laughs> so I find the topic interesting, so I've, I've yeah. done a little bit of reading, but very light reading. So yeah. <laughs> I, I enjoyed the topic. So the maybe we can go into what genetic expression is. It's like the gene that actually uh, participates, or that, that can, how, would you, how would you communicate what is well, gene expression? Remember that the, the language of the genes is, is the DNA, DNA mm -hmm. sequence, the famous structure discovered by Watson and Crick in, in Cambridge, England, in... Uh, in 1953. So it's actually a sequence of four letters. It's like a language. And each part of that sequence has a function, except in, in an interesting way, it's only a subset of the whole, but you have a set of genes, roughly 20,000 and some other bits of the DNA sequence, that actually carry the language that eventually makes all the things you need to be a human being. Right, so it's those sequence. So as you can say that, say a sequence that gives you the code for a given protein, it could be hemoglobin in the blood that makes your blood red, um, and that's what a, that's what a gene is. You can argue about other parts of the sequences that don't make proteins that are also important, but so the genes are really using part of that sequence, and that sequence can vary. Uh, you and I probably have a very large number of differences in our sequences. But the basic structure and sequence, this is more or less there's a normal version of it which functions the way it should, although even that can have variation. So that's what a gene is. And so what happens when a cancer cell becomes a rogue, a particular gene, instead of having its normal sequence or, or no changes that would change its function much, Gets a, gets a change which starts off a process by which it starts doing things it shouldn't do and starts growing beyond what it should be doing. Because the structure, the, the structure of, your, of your tissues is very strictly controlled. It has to take a certain shape. It has other cells beside it that control that. And if that sort of structure is, is um, diverted to doing just growing and not being properly structured, that's when you get a cancer. Makes sense. And as far as, do, do we know the mechanisms that cause this change in behavior for the, for the cells so that they do become these cancer cells? What is it that's causing them to start behaving this way? Well, the, the first question is, why do you get a change in the sequence? That can be just an, a mistake. You know, if you're copying anything, you make mistakes. And we've got a, a very strong process that tries to repair mistakes in a DNA sequence. So that's, that's the, the, the first step. The second step is to say, well, nowadays, because you can sequence everything and you can see what the product, the protein product is, um, there are ways of studying it. So you can find out if there's a change in that sequence that gives a change in the protein, the way it behaves, you can work out to some extent how that, how that is functioning. And you can do that, for example, you can, you can take cells from a cancer and now you can, often, you can grow them in, a, in the laboratory like you would grow a bacterium or, or a yeast. And you can do manipulation. You can say, well, what happens if this particular gene changes? How does that affect the function? So in that way, there's a lot that's being found out about the function of the genes that seem to be the major ones in many cancers that are changed and give rise to the cancer. So yes, there's a lot being found out. And of course, the more you find out, the more you've got a chance of counteracting it uh, in various ways, getting drugs that interfere with the process 
or using your immune system, which recognizes foreignness, can recognize foreignness in a cancer too. And that's a way you can try and treat a cancer to get your own immune system to attack the cancer. You've mentioned now twice, I think, the um, the sort of research that you're doing uses bacteria. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit? How is it that you're using the bacteria? What What is the bacteria's role in well, studying the these phenomena? That comes from the fact you can do genetics with bacteria. And uh, one of the most famous things that was done very early on is you can take a stretch of DNA and insert it into the bacterial genome which is much smaller, of course, than the human, and manipulate that. And that's what you call cloning a gene. So you can work with that. You can make the bacteria or you can make the cells from which, into which you can put some of these DNA sequences, make the protein that matches the sequence you put in a cell. And how, how are you stitching these in? Because it seems like these are such small, small items. How do you stitch in? That well, that, that's, the, that's the technique of genetic engineering. I mean, that, that you can you can do that because there are enzymes that copy the DNA, there are enzymes that cut it up, there are ways of changing its sequence. And that, that's the technology of genetic engineering that allows you essentially to manipulate a sequence. Uh, and if you one think that of, I've heard of recently was CRISPR, CRISPR Cas9, I think was the, the one that I've heard of. Do you work with that one or is it a different, is it, is it a different technique or a different that, technology? That, that's a that's a, a very good technology for changing s sequences of genes in a cell that you're growing in culture. And if you if you think about um, you, you, everybody knows about COVID nineteen and SARS CoV two and that and and vaccination. And uh, you think about the vaccines that have become very effective, the ones that are from messenger RNA. So this, you go from the sequence of the DNA to a sequence of what's called RNA, a sort of copy of that, from which you actually make the proteins. So the vaccines that use messenger RNA take a sequence of the message, put it together in a bit of a lipid that protects it. And that's what these lipid mRNA particles are, what happens in your body, that gets taken up by cells that can then read the message and make the protein that you want from the message. And if that protein is, say, a part of a virus, then the body recognizes it as foreign and makes what we call antibodies, recognizes the foreignness. And then it's those that stop the virus from attacking the cells that it usually would. So there's a lot of that you can That's manipulate the DNA sequence like you manipulate a language. That's so, that's that's insane. That I, and how um, do we already have this being done on humans, or is this something that's only being? Well, the, nearly everything we do now to understand at the fundamental level what's going on with a human disease involves having to know what's going on down to the level of the genes and what they make. Uh, so whenever we're trying to do things nowadays, if I want to study uh, colorectal cancer, bowel cancer, I have a set of lines that have been grown from different bowel cancers, from different people. I can use those in the laboratory. I can manipulate what's in them. I can change things in them. I can see how they grow. I can see whether a particular drug will kill one version of these and not another and so on. So you can do a lot of this without going into the technical detail. There's a lot of this manipulation that can be done. And at the fundamental level of understanding, it's there. Of course, there are levels you know, of, of recognition of a, of, a, of a disease that don't go to that depth and can still find ways of helping to deal with it. You know, if you... And how do you? How would you rate the this these methodologies? So these gen, these genetic sort of uh, methodologies. If we were putting this up against, say, for instance, like uh, radiation treatments and other current treatments for cancer, um, is there more? Would you say there's more promise in this, or would you say that currently, right now, as, as it stands, the 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 best techniques are those that use things like radiation treatment, those kinds of things? How would you rate them? Radiation is targeting X-rays which kill things, which kill cells, targeting them in a way that tries to kill mainly the cancer where it is, right? 
uh, but it can also damage a lot of other tissues. And if the disease is spread throughout the body, it kills me too. Yeah, <laughs> it's very hard. Yeah, exactly. And that's true of many of the earlier so-called chemotherapy drugs. The drugs that uh, you have, have been used a lot, especially in in leukemias and blood cancers, and in children. Um, there are there are drugs that work, but they they just work because they kill the cancer a bit more than they kill the normal cell. But that yeah. can still work quite well. So there are many ways in in which you can. Uh, and you can study this again. And, and, and of course, the surgeon, if you've got a, a, a bowel cancer that's localized to a part of the bowel and it hasn't spread and you cut it out, that's a cure. So there are many ways that that, that has worked in the past. But what's increasingly happening is finding new drugs that might work and finding new ways of using the body's immune system. The body's immune system is there to recognize foreigners, the foreigners of infections, bacterial, molds, but also viruses, of course. And that's that's the whole basis for the, the problem of the pandemic we had. Uh, and the, the body recognizes a virus as foreign. It recognizes cells that carry a virus as foreign. And that contributes to controlling infections. Mm-hmm. And there are ways of using that to try and attack the cancer cell, because the cancer cell can have differences from the normal cell that may also be recognized by the body's immune system. And there are ways you can make that work to treat. So, and, and it's the newer approaches that in the end are probably going to be the major ways of dealing with cancer. But of course, you can prevent cancer from happening. If you don't smoke, for example, you're much, much, much less likely to get lung cancer. If you're That's not, true as well. that, that also helps stopping you. So prevention is very important and catching it early is important because, as I mentioned, if a cancer is just growing at a particular part of the bowel and the surgeon can cut that bit out and it's not spread, you've got a cure. But if you leave it too long and it spreads, then it's very hard to get, much harder to get rid of it. So detecting cancers early, and there are ways that can be done too. It seems like at least in the future, I mean, maybe not right now, but it could at least potentially this te- kind of technology could be a preventative medication. So say, for instance, if we know that um, your your ancestors have a history of, of uh, cancer, could this be used in that direction or no? That's a much different question. So there are inherited uh, conditions where you have a high risk if you have a particular altered gene in your germline, in what you've inherited from one or other parent, it gives you a high risk of getting a cancer. Now, if you know you've got that, then you can detect it, you know, and look for it early. There's a very well-known, one of the best known is is something that that is a form of inherited tendency to get a bowel cancer. So if you know you've got that, so that's where you use the genetic information on the individual's genetic makeup that's present in all the cells in the body. Because if you know, you can test for that now very easily by sequencing. So you know if there's a family that tends to have that susceptibility to a cancer, you can find out which is the person that carries the rogue gene that gives rise to that versus the one that doesn't. And then there are various ways. Either you can, of course, now you can manipulate things so that maybe if you have in vitro fertilization, you only fertilize the the egg and the sperm that don't have the abnormality, or you know that someone's carrying it, then you know you've got to watch out for it. There are things you can do to catch it early. Um, But other ways of catching early is is more difficult. A cancer can release things into the bloodstream by which you can recognize it's there. And that can happen at an earlier stage. And there's a lot of interest in that as as a new development. Um, so there, there are ways of, of the other thing that one can say is about 15 to 20 percent of all cancers, although it varies in different parts of the world with different ancestors that people have in their genetic makeup, um, up to 20 percent of cancers may be due to viruses. Perhaps one of the best known is what's called a papilloma virus, which is the major cause of cervical cancer in women. Now, when you've got a virus, you can actually vaccinate. So you can give young girls a vaccine which will prevent them from having that virus causing a cancer. So that's an actual, that's a very clear way of trying to 
prevent cancers, but it doesn't apply across the board. Remember, there are many different sorts of cancers. They're different when they come from different tissues. Even within the tissue, they may have different combinations of genetic change that can make them behave differently. So you, you said that about 20% come from viruses. What percent is genetically heritable and then what percent is like more environmental? Is the environmental group the, the bigger one or is it more the genetics of our genes that's the problem? Clear-cut inherited tendencies, it's no more than a few percent, five or ten percent, that really are familial in the sense you'll see it in the family. That if it's dominant, as we say, one of the parents may have it, pass it on to one of their children or more of their children. And you see that in a pedigree, in a, in a pedigree of a family going from one generation to the next. That clear cut tendency is only present in maybe 5% at most of all cancers. Don't worry. That's a, that's a fraction so of the. Of the, the yeah. It's a mixture of chance. And, you know, if you're, for instance, sunlight makes your skin go brown, right? Sunlight is the major cause of getting melanomas because UV in the sunlight can cause mutations in the cells, in the skin. So that if you've got light skin and you're out in the sun a lot, in, in, in say, in Af Africa somewhere, you're many more times likely to get a leukemia, a, a melanoma which is a count of the skin, than if, if you're if, if I, either if you're dark skin or if you work in the far north and you don't get much sunlight or you protect yourself from it. So the other really pale like me. <laughs> I am white as a ghost. <laughs> why light skin evolved? Light skin evolved from dark skin in order that we could survive better in cold, more northern climates because you need a bit of sunlight to get your vitamin D from the skin. So it's it's an evolutionary advantage that happened as Homo sapiens, modern humans, moved further north or further south, but it's mainly further north. Um, and My family's from the further north. <laughs> I'm European, northern European, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it, so yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to ask, so as a geneticist, is your approach to each one of these kinds of like the, the acquisitions, so say, for instance, you have um, individuals who are uh, getting cancer as a heritable trait, and then you have those who are getting it from viral viral um, conditions, and you have those that are getting it from sunlight. Is Are the techniques distinct and different for each approach and how a geneticist would approach these, or are they largely related? Well, there's, a, there's an underlying technology which relates to how you sequence genes, how you study proteins, how you do cells, um, uh, all of which really comes from knowing the human genome, which is, is, is in common, that underlying technology. But the detail of actually which genes, which changes are relevant for a melanoma uh, versus a leukemia, which is a blood cancer, or versus a bowel cancer, those are different. So, you know, you people may tend to concentrate on one particular form of cancer and ways of, of dealing with it. They may look more generally at what's controlling the expression of things. Um, it's, but, but there's a lot of different avenues you can follow, and increasingly with modern technology. you know, The first human genome, when it was sequenced and a big fuss was made just after the turn of the 20th century, cost maybe a couple of billion dollars, right? You can now get it for 200 or 300 million dollars, right? Which is a lot less. It's a huge, huge change. But that first step was critical. People said, why spend so much doing it? But it's that first step and getting from that on that, that makes the whole of what we can do nowadays so possible. And it seems like um, I want to bring this to also a more broad context, not just a not just a cancer context, but the the kind of technology that we can apply um, generally to the kind of ailments that that plague us. One of the big ones that I think people don't think of as a disease that some geneticists do consider a disease now is aging. Um, I'm curious, do you take that perspective? Do you think that aging class should be classified as a sort of disease? Aging that we can... is not a disease. Okay. Aging. aging is what happens when you grow older. And yeah. aging comes with an increased risk of diseases. And amongst those in particular is cancer. And throughout evolutionary time, we're all products of evolution, right? 
throughout most of the time of human evolution. We were dying in our 40s, maybe. Lucky if you got to 50. And after that, uh, cancer didn't matter because by that time, you've completed your reproductive, uh, whatever you do to produce children, and your reproductive age has stopped. So there was Natural no... Natural selection doesn't evolution. care after that. <laughs> no, evolution, evil, there's nothing, there's nothing to, hasn't been in the past, clearly. There's nothing much to select for you to be able to live to 80 rather than 40 or 50. And so cancer has has not escaped the fact that as you grow older, it's more likely that you'll get these rogue cells that will go out and give cancers. So if you plot the age incidence of a cancer, it starts increasing sharply for most cancers when you're about 40 or 45 or something like that. So aging isn't a disease. Aging is the cause of diseases, and there are lots of them. Heart disease, I mean, after all, your heart has to work all the time. After a while, it doesn't work as well. You get damage to the brain, which causes uh, mental diseases that are, you know, well-defined as as, as, uh, as Alzheimer's or, or other sort of dementias. Um, and one of the challenges in, in our modern society is as we've been able to grow older, because we've managed a lot of things that stop you from dying earlier, in nutrition, in hygiene, in the way you can treat diseases. I mean, I've had a bowel cancer in the past. I've had all sorts of things done. I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for what the medical profession can do. So that's an increasing problem as you get older people, a relatively higher number, more things you can do about them. That's why medical care is such a big problem. And it seems like this it's could... It, 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 at least as, as far as what I've read, the, these kind of technologies would be the best cures that I can imagine for basically any kind of ailment. I can't think of one that we can't really do something about from well, a geneticist perspective if, if, if the technology was perfected to be able to edit this. Well, um, that's it. That's that's that. It's lofty thinking, I know, but I can't help but be positive about it. For instance, in heart disease, of course, there are inherited forms of, of heart disease but what you need to learn about is how the heart works and what goes wrong when it stops working what can you do to try and prevent that what sort of medicines can you do to in a sense uh, improve the efficacy of the heart if it's not working as well as it should be doing um, and uh, all of that i mean there, there, there are newer techniques that come along but all of that in the end depends ultimately on understanding the biology of what it is you're looking at. If you talk about diabetes, you probably know there are two sorts of diabetes. Diabetes is when you can't manage dealing with sugar properly. And uh, you have in, in the pancreas, you, you have insulin, which controls that. And if the insulin production doesn't work properly, the, then, you, then you get diabetes. But there are forms of diabetes, type 1, which you tend to get when you're earlier, which has a major genetic component. But you can deal with that because you can give people insulin. Here's an example straight off, because you could make insulin synthetically when you knew the sequence and the proteins, and that became possible to make insulin. And that's how people can survive very well if they've got deep diabetes. That's, that's I mean, that's incredible. Cool. I didn't even know that's how he did that. I had no idea that that, that was like something. Oh, no. I mean, I knew that we had insulin. I didn't realize that's how we did it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It was, it was done by first putting the gene for insulin into a bacterium and showing that from that you can make insulin as a protein, just like you produce anything. And, and that's what you give people. Well, so okay. that's one example. I mean, the, the, you know, each disease, each, each tissue has its own different problems. And so I, I had a question, and I know this is a little bit outside of um, your typical yeah. kind of question in these situations. I'm curious about the ethics of these things. I know that philosophy is not your forte. Do you think there are ethical concerns about this yes. when it comes to tampering with genetics? Yes, the ethic, there are some very good philosophical ethicists who have talked a lot about this, and it's been a major discussion throughout the whole development of what we can do about genetics. It, it affects it in various ways. I mean, um, in a simple way, if you know in a given family that there's a gene that's 
found in some individuals and not in others. Um, then sometimes uh, relatives either do or don't want to know about that. And there's an ethical question there is how you how you deal with that. There's obviously major ethical questions around the whole business of in vitro fertilization and um, how how you deal with that. And that's well compelled. And when it when it was first approved um, as a procedure, and Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister who in spite of all things people say about her was actually a scientist and very interested in the science she got some of the best scientists of the time to advise her and that's what led to the considerations that are now taken into account in allowing in vitro fertilization um so that, that there are there are clearly ethical issues in, in, involved in a whole variety of ways but that's of course to of any medical procedure in one way or another, isn't it? You've got yeah, to get someone's sure. consent in one way or another. So, but it is, it's it's certainly true that the genetics in particular has introduced ethical issues that have to be considered. And, you know, if you, even if you do a study as we did to try and find out the nature of genetic variability throughout the um, British populations, uh, you have to get permission people have to be willing to give their blood uh, and know that you're going to find out something about their genetics you have to say we'll we'll keep it um, anonymous so that nobody can find out who you are from the genetics that we found out so you want to control that sort of information um, you know if you talk about AI that's another story but uh, you want to be sure that what's done is is valid and is well tested and properly thought about if you're doing a, a clinical trial, that's different. If you're doing a clinical trial on a new drug, you want to be sure that you're taking the best approach you can do to the way you try it out, telling people about what you're going to try out on them, what the chances of it working or not working are, and so on. So there, there are always here bound to be ethical issues. Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. I think that that's almost inescapable in the in the world of science. When we're tampering with the human body in some way or another, it's there's going to be some kind of ethical concerns. I One reason I ask is because there was this article that I was reading, and um, I, I, I'm forgetting where it was from. It was about a, uh, a, geneti it was about a geneticist who was um, tampering with a germline, and it seems there's a big ethical concern specifically with the germline. Can you go into, one, what is the germline, and then let's talk about why that one's specifically concerned. Remember, as I said, we all come from one sperm and one egg. Sperm carries half the information from the male, and the egg carries half the information from the female. They come together, and that makes up your genome. Right, and that's from that one cell. And when you do in vitro fertilization, what you're doing is you're trying to make that one cell uh, derive them in ways where the normal process of fertilization doesn't work well. So you can substitute that in a way by what you can do in 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 a, in a, tissue, in a test tube or in culture, and give someone already a, a beginningly growing embryo that's going to work when the normal processes of fertilization didn't didn't work. So the, the question has always arisen, well, first of all, if you've got the material before you uh, transplant it into someone, you can find out what its genetics is. So you can actually choose to do the in vitro fertilization without having a particular mutation in it, if you know that that's in the family. So if you know that there's a chance of, say, a half of the egg, of the, of the uh, fertilized egg, having a mutation that you wouldn't like to see segregate because it causes a nasty illness, um, then you can decide you're not going to uh, fertilize with that egg. But there's also the other side of it, which is what caused a lot of the concern, is that using the CRISPR-Cas9 sort technology, which you described, you could, in principle, manipulate the, the embryo or the egg and the sperm. So you could change the genetic makeup in the laboratory. And that's a, a major issue where on, at the moment we don't know enough about how to do it. It's a question of why you would do it and where on the whole the view is, well, that's not a thing we should try and do until we've got a much better idea of how, how we would and why we would.
and the person that you're talking about wanted to do that without really getting appropriate permission or appropriate thinking about it. And so that's that caused a lot of discussion at the time. For sure. And I, th- I think that as we perfect the system, there are some warranted concerns around particularly what they call designer babies. Um, it, well, I don't design, know if... Designer babies are, are what I'm talking about, but they're, yeah. a long, they're a long, still a, a long way off. And and then it, it's for society to decide how much of that sort of manipulation it would like to do and whether, in fact, and certainly if you were ever going to do it, not to do it until you're quite sure that you know what you're doing and you're not doing any harm. Um, so, the, the, But, you know, methics, medicine and treating people has had an ethical side to it. Uh, you know, if you go back to the Greeks, it's, there's always been something that you have to think about when you deal with people. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually never considered the um, the the ethics of like plastic surgery until recently. I have a philosopher that I'm supposed to talk to in about a week, um, who who specializes in the ethics of plastic surgery, and I can't help but think I would never have. I I I guess in the back of my mind, I think, yeah, there's got to be some something ethical or unethical about some of these practices and some things that we do. But it just never struck me as anything to question, like if you wanted to, say, for instance, do it for just aesthetic. Sometimes for your mistake, something goes wrong, and uh, you don't want a, a charlatan to do it. You want a good person to do the operation. That's true of any operation, isn't it? Yeah. How, I mean, how far off would you say we are from being able to achieve something like designer babies? Like, just if you had to throw well, a dart and see well, how far are we from something like that? It's still a long way off. And I think it's it'll be an issue that's decided by society as a whole, not by the scientists. The scientists will tell you whether you can do it. Yeah, they'll say, can we do it? Maybe, yeah. But should we do it? And whether you should do it is a, is a totally different question. And, of course, you can do it to some extent. You, you always first start with animal models. But even mm-hmm. that's difficult because you can do it. I mean, there's, there's Dolly the Sheep, of course, that everybody's known about, but which was one of the first sort of completely um, created, if you will, animals in that way. And there's no doubt that if you can do that, you can modify the genome too. But uh, I, I wouldn't put that on my top list of things to think about. I think we've got a lot more things to think about, how to deal with the health problems as they are now in terms of what we know now and how to use them best uh, for all levels of society, and then how to do better in terms of prevention and and, and treatment and treating older people with diseases. I, think, I, I don't think we should be thinking that uh, designer babies is, is, a, is a major aim in, our, in what we do. That's my view. Not anytime soon, anyways. I think it's I think it's a fascinating discussion. Like it's it's an interesting topic, but it's just oh, purely yes. theoretical and hypothetical and way off. I completely agree. Um, uh, um, I don't know whether you remember the name Mary Warnock, for example. She was a, a key do, person yeah. and a well-known philosopher. She was head of the high school that my daughter went to at one time in Oxford. Uh, and a, a very remarkable um, uh, lady, and she was responsible for the way that the legislation is in, initially was adduce, in, introduced that allowed um, artificial fertilization, in in vitro fertilization, um, and and the, 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 you know the, it, it requires someone like that. Um, to be involved and, and to, to guide maybe on how one should think about these things. And that, that, uh, that, that's, that's going along all the time, I think, with these developments. And what was, what, what was the, the concern with, when it, with respect to like in vitro fertilization? Why was that, why was that controversial? Uh, one, one issue arises is when does life really start? Does it start? Immediately, there's a fertilization. Can you say that when you've got a few cells that have no different characteristics and they're just beginning to create what eventually becomes a person, at what stage uh, can you still manipulate and do something? And that's a big question. And that was a question that was answered by Mary Warnock choosing a date. What is it? 14 days, I should know. Anyway, um, beyond which you shouldn't try and keep making 
a new uh, individual. Um, and th th that's, of course, uh, an issue that just arises as to, as to abortion and how late you, you want to do an abortion and how that relates to uh, the status of the mother and the diseases she might have, the, uh, the reasons that she might want to divorce, and at, at what age can you allow that to happen until and those are big questions. Yeah, and I, I'm curious because you you mentioned Dolly the sheep, and I want to talk a little bit about that too because I find cloning interesting. Um, I don't know enough about it though, so let's 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 go back to that for just a second. Can you explain who Dolly the sheep was, and then we'll go into like how did this thing come uh, about? What happened? The first example of where you'd really clone something you you'd taken a cell from one sheep, and you'd been able in various ways to put that into uh, a cell that develops an ovum that develops ev eventually into the animal. So you actually replace the whole genetic information by another, by another source of it. And of course, you could do that several times from the same individual, so to speak. So that's how you can clone. The cloning means you've got, which is essentially what identical twins are, they are clones, although sometimes, of course, things may change from the time that the egg and the sperm were first produced and, and were copied, so to speak, so that they are the same information. There's still changes that can happen during the process of differentiation of, of, of forming the uh, embryo and then, and then the in uterus growth of, of, the, of the fetus. So, <clears throat> but the, the possibility of cloning is clearly there. And that, but that means cloning means taking exactly the same genetic information and putting it into different individuals. And though I was reading that it had that Dolly the sheep had a lot of like health issues. Why? Why? Why do clones have this this sort of quirk? What's the problem? I think, I think uh, if you go to the institution where Dolly the sheep was made. <clears throat> They show pictures of her. They give you little models of her and so on. I think she lived until she was nearly nine. I mean, she died sooner than one would normally expect. And it's hard to say that. I mean, it's because in the process that you're doing, mistakes may have occurred in the way that some of the DNA was copied. There may be other things that went wrong. So that uh, the, the clone isn't necessarily going to be working as well as you would expect from what it was when it was in its original um, individual. I, I don't think it follows that there's necessarily uh, a, a bad outcome from cloning. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know that that's always going to be the case. I know it, it went that way with Dolly, but again, that was our first attempt. Our first attempt is always the bad one. <laughs> well, what, you've got to ask why would you know what would you want to clone humans for? I don't think there's a good case for that. I have you no might, idea. You might want to clone a racehorse. Uh, that that that's a good point. You might want to clone some kind of animal. I, I let me give you one example of why there we might people, be interested in. There are people who have been so fond of their pets, whether it's a cat or a dog, mainly that they that they've had them cloned because they would like to have another one just like the one that they may have lost. I can't so, imagine why they would want that. Maybe to have a winning racehorse? <laughs> pet that you were very fond of and you kept the cells and you could then clone it. You would argue, well, on, on the whole, I'd expect the clone to be similar to the one that I had before and I liked. Yeah. It's not an irrational thing to do. I can't help but I can't help but think there are reasons to consider like human cloning. Maybe not cloning the totality well, I, of the humans. I'm talking at the moment about cloning cats and dogs and horses, not humans <laughs> okay <laughs> no, i agree i agree i think it's i think it's an interesting idea to, to to want to have you know you want to have your pet for forever if you could it um i think there are probably better techniques to extend their life if i wanted to say for like for instance there's this oh, one really no. great treatment for cats that extends their oh, life no when you've got a cat i think we've, i've kept cats for years and also dogs you know if a cat lives much into the 20s it's very very old i don't know yes. that I has ever lived to be a, over 40 or much over 40. It gets very old, it starts getting old in the late 20s, early 30s. So uh, there's no easy way 
to, to keep an animal alive for a longer time than you would like. If you want a tree, yes, go to the go to the redwood trees in California. They're they're a few thousand years old, but that's different. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I want to ask about this one this this one thing that um, essentially what they're doing is they're trying to clone just specific organs. So and instead of like cloning the 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 whole the whole oh, yeah, person or something like that. Thing. That's a big thing. Um, <clears throat> organoids, and you can take. First, first of all, it depends. There are different technologies, but essentially you can start from something that is like the fertilized egg and get it to develop in culture into different organs. So you can make some that would develop so that they're a bit like the liver and others that develop a bit like the bowel and so on. And if you can do that, and then that's a tool for trying to understand how those different tissues work and their components. Because as soon as you can manipulate something in that way, outside the body, and in, in, a, in a tissue, co in, a, in a laboratory context, you can do things and study things in a way that tells you more about them than you can just by observation. Yeah, I think um, I think it's it's really interesting what they're what they're trying to do. But there's one theoretical one. I don't think we've ever done it, not to my knowledge, anyways. But they're talking about the potential to help solve the the organ the organ problems we have, taking um the cells of the of the person who they're trying to you know say for instance you want to replace a heart, and growing that heart inside of a pig. So you would essentially make it into a human heart. What do you think about those things? Well, I think. Uh... The, I, I think that that, that is the, the, the most obvious case is, is the pancreas, right? The okay. Pancreas which produces, uh, when, it, when it's damaged, doesn't produce insulin. So there's a lot of work and a lot of interest in the, in, could, you, could you reproduce a pancreas in culture um, and then give it back to a person whose pancreas has been damaged? But um, there are problems there. First of all, uh, if you if you take a pancreas from one person, try to put it into another in that way, there are differences that we inherit that lead to rejection. We're, we're all different to a very large extent in tissue types, as it's called. In, they're a bit like your blood types. So that if you want to do a kidney transplant, uh, if you do it without stopping the immune response, rejecting it, the kidney from one person to another is considered a, a foreign organ and your immune system attacks it. So that there are technical problems, of, uh, and, and these happen already. If you do a bone marrow transplant, um, you're taking tissue from another person, uh, and, and that, that, that has problems. If you're doing what's called a CAR-T, a, a, a quite new and quite striking way of treating leukemias, you're taking a person's lymphocytes, some of them, manipulating them in a way that they can attack the leukemia they've got, and you give those cells back to the person, then there's not that problem of them being foreign. But if you want to do it with a sort of cell line where you could use that same cell line all the time for different people, that begins to be a more difficult problem. But these are all, in the end, going to be soluble problems by technology. So I think the idea of doing things, I mean, there's a lot of talk about this, but the idea of, of doing things like that will will come along, I'm sure will be developed sooner or later. Whether you can do it for a whole heart is another matter. But of course, when you do it for whole organs, you do transplantation. So nowadays, I mean, it started with kidney transplants. You've got uh, leukemia where you can give, you know, the, the normal cells back into a person who's had their own cells destroyed, so they get <coughs> they get the, the, the type of um, white cells that come from the donor, so to speak. Um, you can do heart transplants. Uh, the famous case to the start with it was very difficult, but it's now done quite a lot. You can even do lung. So the, the, uh, one way is simply to give a transplant, but then the question is, what's the source of the transplant? And... Um, there's a problem there, of course, if you have people who've died suddenly and you catch, you can use their organs soon enough, then you can use that. Um, you can do, if a person is willing uh, and they're of the right type, you can sometimes say give one kidney 
uh, you can give one one thing to a, to a, a, another donor while the other thing is still working and so on. Um, but th those are those are technologies that have been around for a while and have gradually improved a lot. When it uh, comes to um, when it comes to transplanting, like. Uh, uh, any kind of organs and those sorts of things. You were talking about how the immune system goes to attack it, and you 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 sort of touched on uh, the the way in which geneticists might say, for instance, edit our um, edit our immune system to get the immune system to not. Are you yeah. saying that we? No, you you you, you, you can't edit your immune system. Okay, so what can you, we do? You, en you inherit. What are called tissue types, but you know you you've got A B O A B O O blood types, and you know, you've probably heard of that. Well, there are tissue types on the surface of most of the cells in the body, um, and they are very different. It's extremely unlikely that you and I share much in the way of those types. They are genes that have lots of variability. And that's why it's very unlikely that even with a bit of skin that you want to have from one person to another, it would survive. Now, if you counteract the immune response, there are drugs which do that, then you may eventually be able to get some success. And that's, that happened initially with kidney transplants when they first did them and you couldn't, and, and you couldn't match very well. Uh, but you could see that if you matched, they behaved much better than if you didn't. And that's because whatever you do, you can detect whether a brother and sister are the same with these types. And there's a chance of about a quarter that they'll be the same. And if they are, then you can give a kidney from one to the other. And, and, and that would be a, a, a received as completely co correct. But you can't, mostly you can't do that. You can do that also, of course, with, with, with blood and, and, and um, bone marrow transplants, as it's called. Um, so, that, so that the way to counteract that problem is by the use of drugs. Cyclosporin was one, one of the pioneers of this, a surgeon whom I knew well, uh, Roy Kahn was a pioneer in using drugs that inhibit the immune rejection. And in that way, gradually, uh, it did work that one could do transplants even against these differences between individuals. But How successful are those drugs? Are they, are they, they, are they, they fairly are, successful? Well, there are kidney transplants from the early days have lasted for many, many years. Oh, yes, they're quite successful. That's awesome. That, that's a fantastic technology. We are getting close to the one hour mark. I did promise you I wouldn't take too much of your time. I didn't get any questions from the audience tonight. So um, I do want to give you the moment, though, to kind of tell us a little bit. Are, are there any new publications or new things that you're working on that we could expect to see from you on the horizon? or mm -hmm. From you, yes. Yeah. So any kind of new publications, new pieces I, of information I, I, coming out? Um I'd, I'd say three things. I'm very interested in a particular way of treating cancer by engineering. Antibodies are what the body produces that recognizes foreign things. And you can engineer an antibody so that it recognizes a cancer on one side, and on the other side, it recognizes a property of one of the cells, the lymphocytes, that if it's brought together to the cancer, will kill it. And that's a technology that many people are working on, which I think is going to be uh, a major way in future of treating cancers. Wait, what, what will actually kill the cancer cell, the other cell, or is it going to be the... Well, your lymphocytes, mm -hmm. you've got the antibody here, catches the cancer cell on one end, the lymphocyte on the other. When the lymphocyte is attracted, it's activated, so it kills the cell that it gets to. Right. That's it. That's interesting. Finding the target that's the best target that wouldn't be on every other cell in the body. Otherwise, you'd kill a lot of other cells too. But the, these technologies are developing. So that's, that's, that's one thing I would say. Another thing is, is a little bit more philosophical, if you will. I, I think that one of the most important things to understand is evolution by natural selection. Right? It was... Evolution was an idea that came before Darwin and Wallace, but the idea that it's due to selection was due to them. And I think it's an extremely important idea. It works in many ways. It works within the body in the way a cancer develops. 
and I think that the, there's been a lot of talk about that. And um, with a, with a colleague, we've we've come to the conclusion, and about to publish a paper that says, actually, evolution by natural selection is not just a theory. It's not something which may be wrong, and you'll soon prove it's wrong. It's an inadequate. It's an <clears throat> it's an essential consequence of the properties of living material. Uh, of living cells, that they can reproduce themselves quite well, that they make mistakes, that the mistakes can give selective advantages. And as soon as you have that those properties, you inevitably get evolution by natural selection. And I think it's very important to realize how important a phenomenon that is. That's why we're all here, and we need to understand how we came here, if we can. And that's That's one thing. Another thing I would say, and it's not my area and I don't publish in it, I think one of our biggest problems is how to understand how the mind works, not the brain. The analogy I would draw is you've got a computer. You can pick out its all its parts. You might even find some parts do one thing, some do another. But I don't think just by looking at the parts you can ever work out what program it's, it's making. And I think that's the problem we have in the brain. We know a lot about the cells in the brain, the regions that might do certain things, might be responsible for how we see or how we hear or language. But to understand really how our thoughts develop, I think we're nowhere near that. And I think that's an extremely important area to think about. On top of the fact that dementia is, of course, one of the most serious problems in older age now. I have um, I've talk, I had the chance to talk to some philosophers about philosophy of mind, which they specialize in talking about like, what, what is this sort of subjective experience that we're having? What, what is that thing? How do we account for that? Um, how does mind emerge from the, the material brain? How does that happen? Um, I, I find that section different. And I don't think it's, I have to be careful how I say it. I think it's a problem of science just like anything else. I think you can theorize about it as much as you want, have ideas as much as you want. But you've got to show that that really works, and that's what science is about. So I think we, we don't yet know really how to do that. I think it's, you know, certain things we know about. It's well known that if you damage certain parts of the brain, it's very, you know, you can no longer recognize another human face, for example, and things like that. So I think we've got to deep more de go more deeply into trying to understand the software of the brain and not just the hardware. And I think that's a very difficult problem. It might come, for instance, I'm, I have no doubt that there are inherited differences that give you extreme musical ability. The one I always use is, I'm a great fan of Mozart. You know, at the age of three, he was doing things. At the age of seven, he was producing amazing music. I, I don't think, I always say, it's all very well to say, oh, anybody could do that. I don't believe that's true. I always say, if Mozart had been brought up by Bedouins in the, in the in a desert who didn't know anything about that sort of music, he might have not have composed the way he did. But I'm sure if I'd been brought up by Mozart's parents, I would never have composed the way he did either. <laughs> yeah. So there's a combination of nature and nurture there. That, that's interesting. Yes, but but the, but that's a and in a time when actually nature might give you a clue to what's going on. If you could identify. For extreme mathematical ability is another one. Um, if you could identify at the molecular level the gene variations that might be associated with that sort of extreme ability, maybe that would give you a little way in to understanding more about how the mind works as opposed to the brain. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that from, the, from that perspective. So like sort of understanding how does a savant, so there's there's the, the savants, the um, individuals who are technically not as high of general intelligence, but they're capable of just incredible feats, like being able to hear a song and reproduce it just on in the moment on a piano. It's just, it's incredible what they can do. And you're saying that this, this factor may be, that, that may be genetic. So, so it's, a, it's a genetic yes. thing that they're capable of doing. I, I think that's quite likely, yes. That's that's fantastic. And 
that that is an interesting topic. I do want to uh, fulfill my promise of one hour, and I I'm at that mark now. I hope maybe we can have, I can have you back on. And we can talk a little bit of that about that at some point in the future. If you've followed us along for the conversation this long, thank you guys so much for showing up. I hope to uh, get some comments in the comment section and hear whatever has to say about this topic. To you, Dr. Bodmer, I super appreciate you taking the time to come out and speak with me about this. It's been a real treat for me to be able to talk about this topic because I've not had the chance to talk to anyone about this topic. So you're the first in my line of hopefully I'll get be able to be, to speak with more geneticists and have more content. Put they may not all that. agree with me. <laughs> they, they may what? Say again? They may not all agree with me. Yeah, they may not. They may not. I hope. I always hope to get but a little bit of disagreement. Too, so that's fine. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and end the cast and we will go backstage.